Well, thank you so much, and especially to see the friends, old friends that have known so long, riders, people that I usually see at 100 miles an hour are here <laughs> sitting still. <laughs> we really enjoy it. Um, I like you seeing me in a nervous, uh, lack of confidence state. You know, I'm almost at the time kind of cocky around. But what I want to do is to start how I started art and just take you right to the finish and I'm going to just go through it. Great, y'all. And if you can see, man, we've got still nothing, so let's go. I started off like the rest of us, and in the case of my mom and daddy, they married people from out of the county. So uh, James went all the way over to Jackson County, and uh, Trudy came all the way to Washington County, and that ended up, and that's me right there at their house when I was about five, six, so about 1948. But I did start off, and we are from a Pioneer Florida family. Jimmy, you might need the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Of course. How's that better? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Naturally, I got interested in cars. I mean, what the hell? My dad was a beverage agent, and uh, he was proud. He liked to drive, and so he started. And I was a soda box dirty racer, and that was me. <laughs> but then, you start now. I got through all that, survived childhood and all the other things we did, and suddenly I got out of school, and God forbid, I got a brand new scholarship, and suddenly I was doing artwork. I thought, but it wasn't. It was just on the wheel like this. And the first art piece I ever did was a bust and boom pot. <laughs> so with this in mind, and at that time in life, as y'all know, everybody is concerned with their sexuality and their sexuality and anyone around you and so forth. So bust and boom, immediately into this. <laughs> I did painting cars. I knew about custom automotive paint. So we had potted bombers. And I thought, what the hell? You know, this is it. Let's do it. So we did. <laughs> I'd gotten a scholarship to a Catholic university. <laughs> <laughs> this was my MA show. I went to a school where you had to do an MA. That took two years. MFA, two more. This was my MA show. Up. And, of course, it lasted a full, almost a full three hours before the Monsignor turned it down. And that started another part of my career of continual censorship. So, anyway, that was my MA show of Potty Mama Plants. And uh, at that time... Aunt Jamama uh, was one, and my friend Al Litscombe, who at Bishop College, she was a Black Panther, later we won for mayor of Dallas. He really liked this. He <coughs> really enjoyed this piece. But at that time, you got to remember what times you were. I started building bigger pieces. These are big pieces. You cut them in sections, fire them, get them back, put them, glue them together, and then paint them with automotive. And we had walking mamas at this time. Now, people were wondering, everything was funk and everything, and they said, what the hell are you doing? You studied all this stuff, now you're doing this. I'm just going with no abandonment. And then all of a sudden, here's what happened. So suddenly I did this, obviously a little exaggerated here with this transvestite mama, but Marsha Tucker at the Whitney Museum of American Art had heard about this guy living down there. She came, came up driving up the Mercedes up the driveway, came up, and she came in and she said, well, Jim, she said, this is what you call your art. So I'm getting to, I was in the Whitney Annual when I was still in graduate school. So I got started off with a bang. And then it was reviewed in the New York Times, and they said it was the most perverse piece that had ever been shown in the Whitney. I was a made man. So with that in mind, again, I showed again, I'm MFA, but again, anything got censored. They just covered it in black plastic. So, that's the case with this. Suddenly, like a lot of people, this happened to a lot of people. Suddenly, I didn't have all that free gas, free, free kills, free clay. So I never touched clay again, although I've been a master potter. I could do anything in porcelain on a wheel, build anything with it. But I had to do something. And because these were segmented like the mamas, I started doing those. Put that head on the top. But the Loch Ness was something that I thought about a long time. And I guess I, in some ways, thought of myself as being this creature that nobody knew about, but I believed I existed. So uh, here's a Loch Ness Mama swimming into New York Harbor, and we do things like this, Loch Ness Mama on the brink of no return, looking over the brink into the no return, and so forth. And suddenly, though, I took that drawing, the cursory drawing, 
and I was able to find this calendar vinyl that they threw away. So I took it and began to make my markers out of popsicle sticks and cotton. I put the rubber band around them, take marsh inks, use them like this, and I began to establish these natural symbols, these Loch Ness, the horizon line, and so forth. You'll see more of those. I began to take off. Leslie Collins, whose granddad, I mean, whose father-in-law was a senator there in Texas, commissioned this piece for a child's room, like this model of collision course. And I tried to make something like this. We were using polyurethane foam, and I hang it up in the trees and stitch canvas. You pour it, cap it, swells out, and you had something like this. But anyway, do you like this? There's mm -hmm. Dave Hickey over there on the left, and he opened a clean, well-lighted place in Austin. Like Miss Mama. Uh, rolling in the roses or playing in the roses, and also we didn't know, we didn't have any brains back then. Like we weren't smart like the young people now. So this was fiberglass, and what did I mix with it? Asbestos powder. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise that, but there it was. Then here came this. I did this one, and this was the kind of thing where people would come and they stop out in the driveway and just watch to see what was happening. And then they'd finally come up and they said, "When's the parade?" <laughs> but, but so a lot less mama, door knobs for nipples, the fiberglass here, and kind of got into making a fork situation. Again, I entered it in my first competitions where you send out your new thing. I won first place. That's five hundred dollars. That was like five thousand dollars now. So I was going. Meanwhile, the drawing I'd never drawn, so the drawing started. So I had things like this. I, created this vocabulary with the Loch Ness, Loch Ness <coughs> in St. Louis. Then you also, with the Loch Ness, they had a companion thing called Peeny Mamas, which is kind of this amorphic thing like this that flies around combating with the boxes. These got bigger and bigger drawings. And again, a black line on the front, flip it over, marsh inks on the back. Had a lot of fun with those. They got bigger, that was 15 feet. And began to sell a few of these at that time, detail like this. But again, I want to encourage everyone in the drawing show to show this completely. Just because you can't draw, doesn't mean you shouldn't try to draw. Just go ahead and have at it. And go ahead and I'd come in and it's, I had all these abstract friends. That's, you know, you've got to be careful with them. And so they always wanted, so I said, well, by God, I'll get dense for one. I'll show them that it doesn't have to be readable. So I came and there's what it looked like up close. And Dave Hickey at that point had turned a coin called amphetamine classicism, and th which is a tedious thing where you just keep going as if it's forever. So that's how some of these drawings were without the amphetamine. The basic symbols, life symbols that had come about, house, flowers, transparent box, which was New York, stars, clouds, pink mama, lightning bolts, and so forth. Well, you had to make money. Here was a piece I did, 145 feet, mural at that time in Pontiac Place. You know, he wanted something, had a new car, thought he'd sell it. He put my stuff up. They wouldn't even look at the car. And so, <laughs> uh, say that. But anyway, started using these as a cursory way of drawing. Still held back, but with that vocabulary I could draw. Drawings began to be this scale. I had a vacuum cleaner to the drawings and would really go at it. I never had, when I was a faculty here, I never asked students to do anything I had not done myself. So if I expected a lot from something, from a graduate student, that's because I had done it. I tried to take at some point these things and translate them into metal. Everybody doing metal, sculpture's supposed to be able to laugh. So I made one of these peony mamas and welded steel and painted it. Didn't do anything, it just hovered there. Here I'm in the frustrated one day, and all of a sudden I did this. Well, that was the key, and I'm going to show a few keys tonight. Here was the key. I did this, it's well. I said, bullshit. Why should I draw them when I can just make it in steel and then go do my drawing with steel? So, and it look, would look mm -hmm. something like this. So I began to make my house. I skip right on, and here I am. So I just bring in, instead of bringing pins in, I just bring in all the birds, all the lightning bolts, all the houses, and whatever. And you start with the horizon line drawing, and you begin to draw in this. <coughs> Okay, at that time, there was no words called installation. We called it doing a piece. There was no installation. It was like performance work. Back then, when I started performance work, you called it being your own shrink. You did not call it. <laughs> but anyway, drawing with wire, a type of drawing, this 
was reviewed. It was an interesting show. No one had seen anything like it. And immediately, uh, Richard Kashalik, who's now the director of the Hershorn, came down. He was a young man from the Walker. And he came down and saw this. And we would later take off. At that time, turning the corner was a big deal. You know how the minimalists are. They didn't turn the corner and be a reference. And that was it. They write 200 pages about just how they turned it. We did it, but you see that with this, we turned down back and do this whole room. So for those of you that are interested, and there I was, so my drawings would go to places in the boxes, birds, final stuff. You get there, you do the drawing. Meanwhile, this is in the collection, Dallas Museum. That's a 40-foot drawing. They bring it out about every three years and show it. And then, just like a lot of my work, I don't advise this. If you get start doing something, keep doing it. Don't be like me and just stop suddenly, because people want to know you're consistent. I never was consistent. In fact, I started drawing impossible things. So the female mama mole process release piece. But what you do, you have here, you have five female, female moles in heat. Out here, you have a hundred boy moles. And now, as you release them and they get excited, you track all of the path of them and you send that to a major museum. <laughs> so it's radar tour. Each little guy, if I had a, a laser here, but you, if you look over there, you see each one that had a little antenna in it and stuff like that. So you begin to use drawing to do something you can't do any other way. The porcupine quill projection running conceptual balloon dot drops, suddenly dispersion boom boom piece. You get the same here, you got 58 porcupines just mulling around. You have 29,000 balloons on the way down, and then you have this uh, As the center says up there, it says, uh, on the left hand, will be documented as the boom boom crescentos and the debris pile up. What will be revealed in the long run is this. While under audio duress, that is, when the balloons are falling and popping, Right in their ear. Does a porcupine shit and then run? Or does he run while he shits? <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, like any other artist, back at your house, you have a private life doing things that you can't, don't know what to do with. But you do it anyway. And so, with mine, I was a media freak. I'd never had much at the house. We didn't have much possessions at home. So, every scrap piece of paper I found about the culture, I put up, and of course, you can see everything was for sale in the house. You could have a whole wall for 25000 <laughs> But I didn't know what to do with it. And the house looked like this. Every little reference, especially at that time, we were in cultural turmoil, racial turmoil. There were a lot of things that you would never see now that were taken for granted. They were all over, especially I lived in a tough section of Dallas. Meanwhile, nothing to do with them. But fortunately, I'd got an R69S in 1971. That went to an R75. So this is me on the way to Alaska in 1972. At that time, we went 900 miles. It was before the pipeline. Had a flat time about every 75, 75 miles. Meanwhile, though, I went by this. For those of you who've been on the Alkine, you know, know, I saw that. Again, key point, a catalyst. Always be looking for catalysts that, that are vehicles for your expression. I saw that. I knew what to do. I came back. I took everything that had been culturally of interest to me, stitched it up in plastic, and then I could present that as a human condition piece without it being part of me because it was media that was readily available to everyone. Whether it was about taxidermists like this, diagram of a drug abuser, Manson, eat more possum, whatever it is. And, it took, and then it looked like this. I had had these symbols, I began to combine them together, so you had the human condition as it was in 1972, this idealized version of nature with these life symbols in between, and on top, the neg negative of, of those, the, the remains, the absence of it, because at that time the culture was very polarized and getting more so. All of a sudden, the last drawing that I ever did with these, I took and... Uh, took and wrote these out. The joints began to look like this, and then all of a sudden it was over. Why? I'd gone to Alaska. I'd never seen animals taken with automatic weapons. I'd never seen that type of devastation. And so at that point, the ecological world, which was already reported, became to be more. Some of the cutouts that were used, Lawrence, the houses like this, 
transparent boxes. That's the throat hole of minimalism that it still has in New York today. Why? Architects have taken over. Sculpture is in deep trouble in some ways because it has to fit a building or be one that a building committee will pass. We got some. Then, meanwhile, back at the house. The problem back at the house was that I was working hard, I meant to do well, but I always owed somebody a little money, and they'd come around, the Sears guy would come around, other guy. This was the bill collector's room. When we went in there, I said, come on, we'll talk about it. <laughs>
you could eat off of this. These were immaculate surfaces. And we had everything, as you can see, those are birds and shark jaws. We had power poles and antenna spirits out in the line. So we look at that, you go through it, and what, of course, the students, you know how students are, they're going to call it something. So they, they nicknamed this right away. That's right, Swamp Pizza. <laughs> and so uh, we did that, and that, that day, and with that, I was ready to go to the Whitney. At this point, though, what I didn't like was this paganistic spiritualism that I'm suggesting where things crawl in to be antennaed out. That's what this is about. But with these artificial lights, it didn't ring true. So I knew when I went to the Whitney that I wanted to have lights that we had made. So on we go. First thing I did was blatant. I'd done these tapes. They didn't know me Whitney. I couldn't spell Whitney. They certainly couldn't spell Tallahassee. And so <laughs> I began, I did a tape, and I sent that drawing to the Whitney Museum. And I got a note back and said, okay, Mr. Rush, we'll do it. And so we took off, but anyway, we'll see these. A lot of planning took place. That was the piece we eventually did. And that was the final drawing of it. And then when I got there, I wrote this on the wall. Sand rock, shell and sea, power pole, and money tree, dual catenary, ascension, eagle light, and spirit retention. Graven image to the land, all <coughs> in my background piece. And I'm thrilled that two people who were there are here tonight <coughs> with us. So, this is great. But the Whitney was something. All of a sudden, and I'll tell y'all, if you ever get to 30, some of y'all are already 30. If you're like me, you're so, it's so hard to remember. But uh, I was so taken with this, being in New York, you become full of yourself a little bit. I have to admit, I remember that part. But uh, I got great reviews there. Uh, Studio International, wonderful reviews where they referred to me in a highly complimentary name. But anyway. So this was in 74, and we did a one man there at the Whitney. And I had not, I wanted to show to be worth something. That's why I put these money on all these poles. Nobody could go in there and say, well, they're showing with it. We <laughs> <laughs> need some money. Sure enough, we waited, and then when we went to take it down, we saved all the corn. You understand, that's like 40 bushels of shucked corn and stuff in there. We went to the Whitney, it's the only time at that time that they'd ever kept the museum open at night. We stayed there and we ran on through the night. We didn't leave the museum working on it. Very difficult to put up. Um, I painted the walls in atmospheric blue. I had bobbin, bobbin head flamingos, so the whole time the show's going on, these flamingos are sitting around doing like this. And multiple specially painted <coughs> shells and everything else taken to a very high finish. And I still feel that's a cornerstone in the arts. It's craftsmanship, care, dedication to what you're doing. And I had built the whole drawing diagram back at the house of how the piece would go together. Anyway, it looked like this. And, of course, on the light, I made Zors, which was a Mattel toy. It would have been correct at this time. But uh, you had these eagles, and I hung those with snakes in them and put a lights, and that's what the lights were. And then it went it, at this point it had been up six weeks held over. This was before I took it down. We took it down. People lined up to get the corn so they could take it to the, the pigeons and feed it to them. It was great. So great way to do this. There's that one. Y'all are nice all these off. There's now we move forward a little 75 to 77. With that success, I had opportunities to do some more inside, but uh, Hofstra University, I did some drawings for it, but didn't go ahead with it. Meanwhile, down in my home state, which I love, Walcola County, this was going to be a homage to land and animals. I never was given the opportunity to do a piece in Florida. But it began to draw. And so at that time, with those in mind, people in Buffalo, in Art Park, oh, in Art Park, uh, said, okay, come on up here, let's do this. So with this in mind, I did a tree grave site. And what you had... I-10 was going over the Appalachian River Basin. Some of the last stands of birch, virgin birch in Florida were there. We took those two logs, which were cut down by I-10, made that cross in the center, and it's on the back of a scarab. So you had a scarab carrying this cross as a tree grave sign, and it's down here. On you, Mr. Tree Grave, to celebrate scarab, turtle, and ray, tree sea, rock wind, done gone east, X on cross, day sun piece. And we began to put it together. 
That was it on the thing. We got up there. We're ready to roll. We built this much here in, in right here in Tallahassee, and we went there loaded with a full crew, spider crew, the blues player, some of these guys who were around, and we keep, went there, started making this pathway, cast that. People were wondering. All the minimalists were coming over, and sure enough, I laid this out. <laughs> And damn, if the, the minimalists who were there, Bob Grossman, some of those guys, Oppenheim and people, they came over, not Oppenheim, excuse me, uh, one other guy came in, Point being, they came over and it got here. They said, cool, you finished it up quick. <laughs> 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 it's cool. And they thought that was it because it was the height of minimalism. But as you see, we were just getting to roll. <laughs> and so slowly, you, what can start as an innocent enough idea, you go ahead and translate it directly, lay it down, begin to put this together. You, to establish your ground plane, just like just saw it on canvas, you would use those rocks. We began to lay out this painted rocks we had made and brought there in our trucks. <laughs> brought it there, began to lay the piece out. And of course, I just recently gotten back from the 25th anniversary or 30th, and it's an international show now that they've put together in Buffalo of called Art Park, uh, 19, uh, I guess 1974 to 1984. But anyway, I had also chosen a hooker chemical dump site because this was across from Love Canal. Everybody in Love Canal was walking around and, you know, there was something wrong. It happened. <laughs> so we used this on a dump site. By the end of the thing, the only people standing were well, Spider Pruitt, myself, and Tyler Turkle. And we were, we were the only ones standing at that time there. But as it began to develop, we took, began to pull out the detail. Uh, Joyce Trisler, uh, forget those dance groups, would come up and dance around it at night. Our park was a beautiful thing. Uh, I was proud to have been involved in that. We had details like these little bones we had made, put those in little sharp jaws. And as we began to clean up with pointer rocks, markers, all this is laid out mathematically. You just can't tell it. But we began to do it. And also, you make arrangements for children. This blue flint, we had flowers coming out of marble snakes because if children came by, I wanted them to be able to pick up something. If they wanted to take it, it doesn't matter. As it turned out, one of the, when they reviewed it in New Yorker magazine, I was thrilled that this piece that you were looking at here, after it had been up, I guess, eight weeks had not been touched in any way. And of course it was completely in the open. It could have been destroyed at any time. And a lot of the minimalist art, you had some people that would come, you take a couple of piles of rocks, put a little something on it, that was it. The guys from the local club, who, they had to work around there in Lewiston. That's a hard place to live where they were going. They'd come on, they'd just, they'd just monster mass that. But the fact that they left this one like this was really something. Anyway, began to look like this, and so forth. These snow-capped mountains out there, <coughs> this corner of rocks, and that thing. And there's the they later moved the thing over there. And then up, as you get above it, you see I was on this tailed land, nothing growing there. When you got out there, it was so chemical, you couldn't even grow, you couldn't grow anything, nothing we chose it for that reason because of up above it like that. Now smart artists use a helicopter. I didn't know that. Mine would go like this. Oppenheim came, he used a helicopter, he'd get perfect photographs. Not me. And so forth. Meanwhile, drawing continues, a revised version of this. I still wanted to do this in Walcola County. I wanted it to be even better. I've got that thing. One I also like like this is the UFO landing site. Again, these are lasers. This is the asphalt, one inch equals, what, 50 feet or something. And remember, at that time, you could get the asphalt embedded with seeds, so that even though it was asphalt, seeds would come out of it, and that's what this was going to be done with. Cornered stingray, of course, I was the stingray cornered by minimalism. This is in a collection here in Tallahassee. And I did, kept feeling that, never got over that. What these were drawings for were pigmented concrete. So the I, my father's been in the masonry business, and I wanted one, one color, and you'd gone up like this. So pigment and concrete, but never got to do anything. This Spring Creek legend lightning eel is a lure sting and kill type deal that patrols the mouth of river meets coast. This pink on down, simple host to protect marsh, bird, fish, and gator, making sure they'll have a later freshwater guardian piece. At that time, we began to get more vehement with the um, ecology. And 
I had a strange thing begin to happen. It only happened three times where when they did a show with me or even thought about a show, it became the last show that that director got to do before they got <laughs> so this was one of them. I proposed this for Provocal uh, up there in Chicago, and we're going to do something like this. Again, a reaffirmation of America. We're here to stay together and stand, and we'll, what, something bust your ass if you have the wrong plan. Free, free forever or die peace. So it was for Bicentennial. But what actually came out, and once in a while you do these proposal drawings like you'll see in here, and then someone will say, hey, I'll fund it. When that happens, what do you do? You jump to the occasion. So on this one, <coughs> 200 years, even animals down there brought the snake crawling back around, flashing symbols for one and all, don't fail me no more, y'all. They begin to do it. So I said, I'll do one. They said, let's do it. So I did this acrylic snake that had symbols on it. It was a on minimalism. You had this thing. But I wanted adorned with things that were obviously man I mean, this is obviously man-made. I wanted some shapes to float over it as priority, to show that something made by hand floated over the dry and somewhat, uh, somewhat, to me at least, boring grid that was there. Do we really need that many more grids? So many people. Anyway, the snake, and this went on to the Paris Biennale. Again, in the New York Times, there it is. I had a nice review in the New York Times. And in the catalog, uh, Hugh Davies wrote how it was when he had to undo this for customs. <laughs> but it looked like that. Meanwhile, I had loved cars all my life. Bicentennial was coming up. I collected blues and loved blues all my life. Had a little bit of a blues collection, but got off on it. From the very first time I did the twist of Jimmy Reed, and we got on out into Slim Harpo and everything else. Uh, I loved that aspect of American music. So I wanted to do for the Bicentennial a Bicentennial Welfare Cadillac. Well, I started off with that Cadillac, I thought. Black flocked body, AM, FM, sh shortwave, TV, X-ray, sonar, 200-gallon saddle tanks, one-way glass, all-around uh, all compass, stuck on legs, sunglass cabinet, vacuum-powered joint roller, uh, <laughs> and so forth. So it had everything, the Cadillac and everything else. This was one of the original drawings. As it turned out, we went looking for Cadillacs around the country, and we found this one in Lake Worth, Texas, a one-owner Series 65 Cadillac. Now, this is distorted a little in this PowerPoint. Let me tell you, this is low lean. And this was the first year of the hydraulic V8 engine in America. So it was the first car uh, that you could buy across the country that was run a sustained 100 miles an hour. Next time, well, we always needed money. CGL for sale, we sell anything, anything, but we did the Cadillac and built it. I didn't let anybody touch this because I didn't want anyone to be, have something happen on this paint job, which we had done at the Cadillac Proctors here in Tallahassee. It was that thick, that paint was. It was another cheap. This was, this, was, this was thick. And it had it. And it's on the doors. Why, of course, they can print the slaves. So you had those on the door. And this was a homage to. to to not only African-American preachers, but blues players. And so, with that in mind, we began <coughs> to look at some of that. You had a short, shortwave radio in it. These guardian uh, figures here, uh, what do you call them, the little music boxes, and so forth. All over it began to be it. Axe in the back, use it once a year. It's Thanksgiving axe, use it once a year, cut the head off the turkey, <laughs> and so forth. Something like this. Just some details in the back, full length mud flaps, help pipe probably work, boat choppers, but lights that went out to the side because a lot of times guys be drinking, you couldn't see straight, you had to kind of get your head out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to, and in the back, like this, you had these hands coming up with organ speakers, and it looked like this. This is in the Bolger collection in Kansas City now, and has been completely, this is one of the featured pieces if you go out there. All symmetry, devil's pitchforks on a thing like this. And the point of those, they're sitting there, but when you get to going, they rise up and spin. But then when you stop, they'll drop and they make a clicking sound, and you'll know you're not moving anymore. So, <laughs> we had that down, got that down, and that was it. This was, kind of like, this was a lot of fun. I'm sorry it's distorted. There's a little bit, you imagine it. You're on the Niagara Gorge there. 
12 foot whip antennas. And when you came to a stop, this went on for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling, come on, man, of uh, uh, mud flaps and then static straps. Everybody needs static straps. Don't y'all feel like you need something? What's one of You drag along, you build up a static thing from your tires that sparks. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, and I suggest this to everything, on your drawing, anything else, always have a body of work going that you can work fragments and they'll come together eventually for, for a, a, a fixed larger piece. These are like words. And if you have enough of them, you get a paragraph in a book. So back at the thing, back at the shop, sailing in a stone canoe, small piece of stuff, tarpon descending the staircase. And then on one like this, Art Forum was in so control of us, you cannot believe the power of the critics. So I just did this piece. It's uh, rivet them up, lace them up, nail them up, clamp them up, trap them up, lock them up, bolt them up, uh, juice them up, and shoot them up, and hang them up. <laughs> and so, and it looked like this. That's in with its own collection. But it's a kind of a comment on that, that at the time. It's hard not to be influenced a little bit by the, the conception when we all were in the from it. Swamp Gate Bowling, the Everglades. This had to do with some of the things that were going on. Nature, usism versus themism. Clear for takeoff. One of the things that Nixon did that was good when they did everything they could. And of course, Florida will pass anything. You know, they were telling everybody, just come on, get it right now. Just, uh, come on, we're ready for it. So, and it was the same way there. They were going to let the Concord jet land at Miami International. It killed all the birds, turtles, <coughs> broke eggs, everything else. So that was what that was about. It was clear to take off the Concord. Nixon stopped it. Man eating skateboard. George Miller has this thing in perfect condition. He's kept that here in Tallahassee and uh, so forth. Now and then, every once in a while, you'll do one where you don't expect it to, but in Europe, they really like vampires. <laughs> Stuff like this. So this went to the Paris building Biennale and just kept traveling. And they like it. And of course, the thing, in case of a vampire, I mean, it, you break the glass. <laughs> you know, that's right there. Silver nail. You break the glass, give you that, bury it. <laughs> so just. And then some pieces, Search for Roots, which was dedicated to Ree Morton. We lost the of the group. But begin to do single pieces, and for all of y'all who are working, remember, if, if you, not only if you think it, you can do it, but stay right on the front of your mind. Don't question yourself too much. If you're right on the front of your mind, you won't know why you're doing it. That'd be, that'd be four or five months later. Suddenly another opportunity came along. I wanted to do something that harkened back to my heritage, and I wanted to do a variation on the traditional theme of descent from the cross. And this is the only one of just a couple of pieces that I ever did <coughs> to an extremely high finish. The Creative Time had started uh, an exhibition that's still going on in New York, and they bring people from around to do it. This was the first one, and I began to assemble this piece. It was beautiful in here, and of course what you have is you have church door, a coffin, your name here, and this one says his name here. Oh, so, so it's Jesus' cross, oh yours, collective heart of mankind. And nowhere does this touch the floor. It's in three parts. This is not leaned up. It's a complete, you can pick it right straight up if you had to. It's completely, and then of course the Rock of Ages over here. So I began to do that, and it was a beautiful piece we've shown multiple times. And, but I didn't work much in that tension. I should have. I did some. There's a new, this was written, written with hob, hobnails on there, so up close, and the finish on the wood. You can wax it just like a and all. So that kind of finish I did, but it was hard. Looked like that. Just a couple. Now another one, Gary Gilmore, he's a weird guy. He did things wrong, but all of a sudden, what did he do? You all know the, the, this? He sued to be executed. He said, by God, I got... Sentenced to death, I want to die. I did it, I was wrong, I want to die. They said, no, you can't die. So he said, I do want to, but anyway, in his writings, he talked about a vehicle that he would be taking someday. So Gilmore, with his case, uh, uh, execution was made illegal again in America with the Gilmore case. This was about that, and this is called freedom of choice. Notice the inverted cross through my work is always the gestalt of the the crucifix, it's in a lot of the work, it's in there. That's just burned into you, it's either 
with you or not, it doesn't matter, but that's in there. And you, what is it? It's kind of a chair on the back of a trilobite, which was the first animal that went out from the land, out on the, I mean, from the ocean onto the land, and it's, you're fixed to it. These are slave chains. I had chrome, actual ones that had been used in the galley of the boat. And you're fixed to your, to your choices here with this bell. But a nice piece comes apart just like a kit. Just comes completely apart, symbols put back together like one of those things. But with high finish, I don't see any... There's people who can do this so much better than me, the cabinet makers. But at one time, we were doing much more hands-on. Now everything is so conceptual, so it's quickened out too much. Maybe it's because it's a quick world. Nonetheless, on we go. Terrible picture, though. I mean, that this picture. Y'all kind of put, putting up with me. I'm doing my time. See, I got burned burn now. <laughs> 77 to 83, again, in generally. Started right off. 1977, not to get political with you. We reached the point where not only did our inflation go to 22%, we were at the closest point we ever re reached to just being kind of a socialist country. I couldn't feel good about that. So, ground zero, bomb out, greed. Some of these drawings we'll see. These are all you'll get to look at them. Meanwhile, you're at the shop doing Tyrannosaurus on skis for Lake Placid. They wouldn't take it. That's what I wanted to do with the sculpture of Lake Placid was that right there. And uh, large. But they didn't take it. And uh, they just, just, you know, I was just... Problem with being an outsider artist is if you get too far outside, you can't ever get back in. So uh, the eyes of Florida was for right up town. I called Eastern Airlines to make sure before I made the proposal. I said, do y'all fly to the capital? Yeah. I said, do you look down at it? Yeah. So this is the House of Representatives right uptown town would be right there. This is used to be that land. This is going to be a goldfish run with fountains and poles that you stood against. And this is pigmented concrete. And uh, there's 67 pairs of eyes because there's 67 counties in Florida. So they get to do that one. All of a sudden, so all of a sudden, now it's problem start. Let's start. Let's talk about some problems now. Uh, something's going to be out of order here in that we wanted this written thing about what this is. I had talked about narrative so much and how much I didn't like something that wasn't narrative to the point where I began to take a lot of criticism and I said, well, you know what? I'm going to see if I can imply a narrative convincingly about the culture right now. And I had done a body, a companion body of work I worked on called Days of Reckoning. And in line with that, went the end result of constructing this theory where I wanted to trace the progression of a single ruler or chieftain, single ruler or chieftain, and then go all the way down to matriculate to world government, which we may see someday. But the problem was I chose the wrong symbols. Even though it was a symbol for this in other cultures, it became only a symbol of something that be told. So immediately, <laughs> as soon as you have a modified swastika, even though it's a single ruler chieftain, God's garden is cave, that's all he wants, his family, him, his budge. Goes where you have problems. But as you see it matriculate, here's what it did. It starts, it begins to divide, it begins to divide more, 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 struggle for the middle ground, and come on out this other side like this. Burnished pigment on linen cost me my eyes, that's why I got glasses now, because I couldn't see all those drawings took an incredibly a long time <coughs> as we... Oh, there, let's see, what is that? Yeah. yeah, okay. This attempt to span a period of years through the use of multiplane geometric forms and trace with implied narrative the transformation of single ruler territorial governments into one world socialist states. Basically, it starts with a soft swastik and ends with a grid. Uh, that, when I took this to the University of Massachusetts and I showed it for the, another controversial body of work, there were you know, like 400 people, demonstrations, things like this. Uh, when you have a cracker accent like mine, you can't, you're going, it's going to be seen differently than this. Uh, so these kind of pieces like this, wonderfully done, but the wrong sense this is graphite. Goes with this, that, that, that. That, 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 so forth comes out. It's helix is star. Double helix here. This took so long. Got to understand now, that's a black graphite line 
right between it. You touch this to that, you got a smear. No smears on these. And then blitz, and then world government. So that was the end. This is in the collection of the University of Massachusetts. Number six is at the best collection in Houston. And the other one is in a private collection. Meanwhile, you got Atlanta. You got to always raise the occasion. They started to Piedmont Park there. They invited me up there. And what was going on at that time? Wayne Williams was going on. And it was tough. You went there, and this wasn't nice. They were looking for kids, and everybody's carrying baseball bats and stuff with them. So I went there, and I did, at the turn of the century, what would be known as a, it's a box out with wings, but it was used to hold the antennas, fly the antennas for the steamer ships for Oceanic. They were search kites. They, they were like search kites, so that's what I made for this. Anyway, uh, 600 feet of rope, you had to pull it with a CJ-5, we never flew it, but that was there. Just to show that sometimes you'll come out, this is flex steel, this is, is 18, a little over 18 feet up, that's uh, part time. But anyway, always be ready to move in a cultural direction. Use what you know, what you've given talents of construction and anything else. Don't be buffaloed by the fact that you can't mix the paint right or that you can't drill it straight. You can do it. And it looks like this. So people on farm. Meanwhile, again, back on the thing. We're in days of reckoning now. What do you start with? You start with life. You prepare them to try. You become a working man. It's nine to five. You kind of get a tone of vision. You have minority pressures. There's forced equality. Then what happens? Perhaps unit productivity, not enough to go around having whole cargoes of fear find out. World government. <laughs> <laughs> in that scenario, I begin to do some sculpture. So this is preparation to try. I notice the teacher has gum chucks and stuff. But that's how it looks in the studio when you display it. More than I want to finish like this. So I didn't do, I showed some of these and didn't do them all, but we'll just look at them. Life was simple, this bed, it was just a homemade bed. It has a cross, a walnut cross underneath it. But that bed was made, and it's not unlike the beds from an earlier, much earlier time. So that was it. Working man, it went up on that wall. And then, this is after you retire, after you've uh, gone into retirement some ways, and you anticipate how it's going to be, it's nothing like that. So this chair was interesting. It was made by a blind man. I've never seen him. He made that chair. So these pieces, but it looks like that when you got into the museum. It became pretty good sculpture. Those showed a lot. Tunnel vision. These are just rough studio shots. Team showed a lot. Teamsters. This is what you would see in the 20s if you went to a Teamster meeting. You would have, this is more like the placards that you saw. If you've seen Matt Wan, for instance, uh, and if you're familiar with the music out of Gastonia, Carolina, that came out of the mills there, the music that was written out of the mills when the unions went into Gastonia, it's very interesting. Those are kind of in line with that. Of course, the quality. This has the tombstone of initiative is over in, in uh, marble up here. And then this, this piece was in that scenario, and I think this was not enough to go around. And then having the whole, and what happens here? Little brass plaques having to hold with things of concepts of democracy or America written on this cargoes of fear because it may get like this now. You may see if it comes down, it's already like this. We've certainly saw some things like this when I went to Haiti one time where you saw someone who could, could easily have everything they own in one thing and they're just trying to stay mobile and stay out of people's way. So cargo's of fear, and then of course the world government just says stay in line. You got a homemade rat cage up here. Studios like this. Friend died, motorcycle accident. I left the house, drove directly where he'd been killed. Non-stop. That's the way of St. Louis. Came back and made this piece. Always if you have a feeling about something, do it. It was a duck you pushed and flapped its feet. But always do those things too if you'd like it. Gave it to the family still like I did pieces that, a whole bodies of work that I don't have, that I've done, I just don't show them, because they're censored in some way for just violence. And here, the reason this is close is a reason. You'd have memory, you'd have, you'd have bad memories. When the Cubans went into Angola, it was not playful. 
It was ma it was major. So when you ran people through saws, just take a rip saw you'd use for lumber, you'd run a person through there two or three times, throw the arms out there. So I, with these photographs, we showed it, but you just, these are the kind of things an artist has to be careful. Same thing here in some ways. It's very politically incorrect, but you know what happened. And as an artist, you don't necessarily take an opinion or a position sometimes. You pulse. We're mechanics for the culture. That's what we're for. You become a mechanic for the culture. The culture's going wrong. You tune it up, just like you would your car. And when Reagan went in, it wasn't so much Reagan. I mean, he was he, he going in had great uh, presidency in a lot of ways. But the rise of the fundamentalist church was major. Falwell, the Bakers, I can't even remember all the people. Suddenly it's everywhere. I was taken with how frightened people became of that. And so I wanted to do some road crosses, which used to be common in the South to see, but now it's very difficult. And But I took them pretty far here. Forget legal aid services. He knows if you're guilty. Jesus does not plead bargain, no technical acquittals, and stand more than that. So these pieces begin to take off. All everybody in the same thing. Begin to put these down. <coughs> then I did this show, the one I was talking about in, in Massachusetts, and this was gotten boy, not boycotted, but definitely uh, was problematic. <laughs> and so these, I didn't have these paintings at that time, but things like this, it's, you know, child abusers, wicked porno dealers, and cancers, Homer, this is deliberate now, it doesn't say it's Homer. That was the term that was used on the low watt stations, we call them, was a Homer, back to the, you know, way times, Iliad and all, Jesus wept, and so forth, very early. Whoops, what did I do wrong? Oh, excuse me. And then some of these, we just begin to paint. All these are done with my <coughs> finger. You take the paint on it, and you do it there. So every one of them done with your finger. They're thick. Only a pagan would run from the foot and cry, so forth. And these early ones were reasonably simple. You don't have to go to hell, but you can if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you begin, and I begin to explore these somewhat innocently. And then all of a sudden they begin to turn in a different direction. You don't think Jesus is looking, do you? Well, he is, he knows. And then you begin to do this, they begin to go more, and so forth. And at this point, they became began increasingly political. We showed some, few of all, but again, a lot of all that. Are you wrinkling sheets of Jesus and so forth? I liked this body of work and liked doing it very much, but found yet again, as some of y'all would feel, that no matter what my intentions might be, if it's public, you can you can offend someone. It doesn't matter how much. <laughs> you can offend someone with this. That was not the intent uh, in any way. It was just to chronicle what was going on, in, in it, and it did. And as they got more intense, of course, this paint stick, it sticks out that far. All this goes out, it's put on there. All the wood was done with methyl chloride first, so it would hold the paint, and it's still on there today. You have to sand it off to get it on. Right did right, left did wrong, plenty of water, nothing but fire. Everything divided in the basic choices that's the focus of Christianity. Everybody's got a choice. One asked for forgiveness, one didn't. So everything in that direction. And this was a big uh, thing in 1980. So, lame walk, mute talk, deaf hear, blind see, dead rise, and children leave when Jesus opens the door. Will you pass through? And so, what's the matter with you? B-U-O-D on Dr. Evil, soul suckers got you, P drinking devil water, staying out late, pray now, fly later, or play now, fry later. Right. Which for you, me. <laughs> and then we begin to do the stand-ups, like the sandwich boards. <coughs> and they, then I really began to scream loudest, said the devil, good to see you. He bad. And so forth. Some of these came, and I began to do some sermons at that time. I was very fortunate later when uh, Jonathan offered me an opportunity to do a sermon on this, we did it, and I was so pleased that he never knew how much it meant to get to do that. Because I would, did some, about 10 minutes was a blow and a half, but it came out of this body of work. Those are, those are about 12 feet high up there, so it's good, good enough scale out of these. So 
they were both sides, just flipped it over and showed the other side. And asking things, then it got into this, are you lost, confused, overall, backsliding, anxiety ridden, in devil's debt, worried about just all of it. And really you begin to talk about the society a lot. So that body work basically like that. Again, if, you, if it comes into your mind, go ahead and do it. You can figure out later why other people, the critics, will let you know. But a good artist should work right on the front or the cusp of their mind. In performance work, it's very important you stay right, on, in my opinion, on the cusp, especially <coughs> if it's right into the mind and not planned, not rehearsed. There's Hugh, my brother, who's already tall. So you can see this 16 feet up here. And uh, we did some of the larger pieces. These showed in multiple venues. With that in mind, I did the V-Boys, a series of V-shapes. Just all of the crucifix, you'll see them in a minute as we look. This is in my studio. I always dreamed I would get to show these, sent out uh, multiple hopeful notes on them, but again, never got the opportunity to really show these except one time, showed five of them but really still thought this was pretty good body work. And as you look at them, you can see that they're from mixed media, put together, and they look like they leaned up. They're not. You can take that and just shake it. You can't see it, but there's all, it's all tied together and put together with wires and everything else. Pieces like this. Now, some of the finished pieces, self-service island, like this. You got John Wayne on one side, JFK on a white horse over here. <laughs> and here, this is my mom, Little Angels. This was my family. My family of five is what it's called. So it was myself, my two brothers, my mom and dad. And this mom. And then some of these like this. Chief Easy. Liner. Uh, or you, I mean, you can't see the line, the end part. But uh, there. In of antiquity, the sculpture, and so forth. And that's what it was like when we showed it together at the Newberger Museum. It was in an international show that they have every two years. I was thrilled to be included, and the first time I'd seen a lot of the, some of the people that I hadn't seen in a long time. I really burned through this. There I am. I like the t-shirt. <laughs> the only drawing I've ever done. That's why we're showing it in the show. And it, look, it looks like a moth. It looks exactly like the moth. Were you moth? <laughs> some people have seen it. Wegman was up there. We really liked it a lot. That's Wegman with all the man ray and all, I think that's Jimmy Joe Whaley looking at him. But Bill, we go back a long ways and keep up there. So anyway, I had done this show, it's on front, sent to place, I burned through these, just showing what the work looks like now, all these years later, in a museum. So you have a museum. Unfortunately, this museum closed. In my opinion, it was the most contemporary and best designed museum in the state of Florida. People just didn't go to see it beautiful exhibition space. So when you put all this together, you begin to see how things can really work for somebody. What will look, when you, you, you look back on things, and you see that, my God, you just keep going, keep going with it. You know, there's going to be a lot to show tomorrow that are nothing like this. All this. The sense of place. Of course, the potty mom, her mom is still there. They're in great shape. Joe and Sandy bought one. I'm so thrilled. It's on the slip. Only piece I've ever sold in Florida. And uh, they got it. One of these. And so forth. Just to show the feel of an exhibition looking back at, at my age. And I won't tell you how old I'm up. I'm, I'm up at age. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jonathan Demi had, we had, he'd come through, he was doing something. I had this crazy studio up there in uh, Havana. And it, you hear him tell it they looked over and they almost stopped the car because I had a piece and there was one pope that was only alive for like a day and a half. And he, meanwhile though, because he was the pope at the Vatican, they made beautiful trays and they put butterfly wings in there and he's in the middle. Johnny saw that tray, he just wanted to find out whose building that was. He called, long story short, we hit it off immediately and uh, I began to have this uh, association that's still going on today. So here we are at this early film, A Marriage to the Mob. If y'all hadn't seen it, for God's sakes, you should. It's a lot of Meanwhile, we're doing other things. We had started on outsider art. You have to do a little bit of everything, unsigned, unsung. One that we did here, we showed, contributed. 
I did some pieces like mystery packets, not to be open and so forth. We'll see some of this. Best of. Uh, this, uh, this is a uh, flu mask. Any of y'all, you know, any of y'all worried about flu, see me after class, I'll show you how to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am is uh, Brother Jim, so this kept going. It's doing this is everything. Uh, you know. And then, of course, cleaning up the yard. We do it once a month, whether you need it or not. And there's a, the month. And this was the, this is, this is a pickup truck. That, and I know y'all got Ford 150s. This would drive a Ford 150 to LA and back with it just doing like this behind me. <laughs> That's an International 1210. And uh, that was a good one. My brother Hugh, to his credit, drove this at approximately, I think we averaged about 75 miles an hour all the way to Mexico and back. Okay, John Glory Roads. Meanwhile, behind everyone is something that's in the closet, one way or another. I could not and cannot shake motorcycles. Fortunately, in this room right here tonight are multiple people who also feel the same way. We don't know why we don't care. When we're on the front of something, at, on that bike, we feel, whether we are or not, more alive than the other people around us. So, with this in mind, over all these years, in my case, 40 years, now a full 40, because I had already started traveling, but I consider my bike starting really in 1970, although I got my first Ducati in 1966. But, this body of work now came to a head when we were asked, uh, I'd been, they'd hear my cracker voice, out there in California when I called them, and they just think it's another car hop from down there in Alabama. But so they came up with a race, the La Carrara Mexican Road Race. I'd been practicing all my life for that kind of race because all I'd ever done was find roads where I could run just as fast as I possibly could, completely legal the whole time, and survive. So anyway, La Carrara was it. We went out there. Everybody else, they had helicopter support teams. They had everything. Uh, my brother and I went out. We went in our truck, got our thing out, uh, didn't even know, didn't know anybody, and of course we were running, with, what we later would find out was the defending champion, Fred Iker. Mine got down here to a clutch problem, I had to go to the crankshaft in the motel room before the race, but the point being that we did, and even though they held us up, there's you, he's fixing to punch one of these guys out, they had to do <laughs> because they wanted the Ducatis out there. The first Ducati came in, the factory Ducatis, they were running. I come in, next Ducati. They, that was too close. So when it came time, they, they helped me back. To, you pushed them out of the way, and I took off. Anyway, the point being, that's uh, some magazine from Europe, photograph that I'm going over. And we had gone out there, and we set a record in our class, which was the 1,000cc unlimited class that was never broken. So I did run the 125 miles over three mountain ranges. And this is the San Andreas Fault. We ran from... Uh, Ensenada to San Felipe, and with an average speed of one, uh, 107.69. So we were rolling, and we had built this engine like we would in the old days, build either a stock car, like an Oldsmobile, or a, some of our uh, sports cars. Anyway, from that. Meanwhile, roads. We're going to see these. What happened, though, at some point, as my memory began to fade, I began to just do some sketches. So back here in 79, go to this. You'll begin to see some of these routes, and I would just try and draw home. This was our early circuitry in Tallahassee, and when we would run. We're back here now in the, uh, in the 70s. We would run these roads. Then they kind of got like this, began to figure them out. You're going to see these later on. We burn through them like this. And then when I run every single Sunday morning, if I can, began to be the Havana Open Loop 100 mile. And that's one that we do run. <coughs> But this went on, and I began to expand. I said, well, I'm, this is fun. I'm going to do more for myself. Start, finish, 100 miles. I sit right here. My best record for this, personal, well, for this 99.7, uh, is 64 minutes flat. And that doesn't sound much, but it is. It's not good. <laughs> and of course, the bottom line, the bottom line expect the unexpected, foot down, stop at every stop sign, clean, clutch in, coast to it, church zones, all animals have the right of way, give aid when needed, do not drive beyond the limits, slow down and show respect when you're in towns, communities, and gatherings, full body protection mandatory at all times, period. Respect all law enforcement officers and abide posted things. 
do not drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as these come up, y'all get to see them. This began to take on off, and this became the foundation of the loops, the Bear Hair 100 of Bear, Georgia. The West Georgia Spider Finger, 850 miles, two day time trial. That whole coast over here where Georgia meets Alabama, very fast. Beautiful Buckhead 300 time trial. Again, call up here. I can see Cloudland to such as Hog Jowl to Wolf Pen from Hero to Zero and back again. <laughs> so cool. My Missouri Bat Cave. Now, when you're in Missouri, Everything is he leading to a cave? He just left the cave. He just <laughs> fall in the cave. And so it's but a beautiful part of the country. That's the uh, you're on the Arkansas border here. This is the uh, Mark Twain Forest. Then the Knob Hollow and Run 350 mile TT. This is West Virginia, and nowhere in the country do they get as obtuse with their curves as they do in West Virginia. You just can't run in West Virginia. Too much. Just too, too much. Anyway, Coalfield, this is in Washington. These are what the ones I want y'all to see. The Texas Hill Rabbit. This isn't in here. This is in collection in Texas. Right now, Jim Jarred, who's a Bonneville person and stuff. They, Rocky Comfort, a TT, again, some of these pieces here. Detailed, I can't wait for you guys to see it. But then the expensive ones. Now, drawing like this takes months. And all you're going to see, you're going to say, where do you get the month out of it? It's just a line. <laughs> the black line is a GPS line. The rest of them is me doing this. But when the GPS gets squiggly, that's not me being nervous. That's the way the, the road is. So that's the full North Georgia, which is our major running area, the Chattahoochee Caterpillar Crawl 440-mile time trial for open road motorcycles, eight eternal loops. Closer to home here, the eastern loops here, the Havana 100 Monticello after breakfast, north half sliver, Thomasville high speed endurance loop, so forth. Even marking, some of them we mark fatalities. I don't know if that's going up everything else. Again, this is the full 750 mile, Tallahassee's here, the contiguous route, 750 miles. I don't know how many internal loops, seven or eight. We, you pick your loops, and we used to just pick your loops, and wherever he had been the previous weekend, you go to another loop. So cut throughs, Quincy's, y'all see all these tomorrow. Blue Ridge, Tallahassee Crown 600. I'm hoping this will eventually stay in Tallahassee at the home of Frank Willis, who has built easily the most exciting piece of architecture in Tallahassee. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Willis Dairies, Centerville, the best. Dixie Cup, Dog Head, some of these around here. Sky Dog, this is Colorado, this is beautiful. You hear you're at 12,000 feet, you're running right in here in a riparian area. That's where riparian means where water starts to form. But all these that just look pretty minimal when you see them, I hope you enjoy them. This is one I did, and it's hard, hard to, when you think of Maine, it's too dangerous because you've got all these <coughs> trees. But down on the corner of New Hampshire are some mountainous areas, and that's a recent one of up in there. I don't have many from up in there because it's just too, too dangerous up in there. Great. Y'all, thanks for putting up this. <laughs>